first guest, ladies and gentlemen, is a strategic business partner who helps business owners run their companies more profitably and more efficiently, also known in this sphere as uh, Mr. Biz. And he's right now in our fireside chat. What's going on, Ken, Mr. Biz? How's it going, Finch? I've been looking forward to this, man. You got me all stoked. You got me fired uh, up. I'm glad you're excited because I am overly excited, man. Listen, we met some time ago in the clubhouse, and uh, after some back and forth, we finally got you here, man. I'm glad you're here. Are you stuck? Yeah, I got stuck there for a second. I was kind of freaked me out. Kind of freaked me out. <laughs> okay, we got to get you off the fence right now, huh? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You get my ass off the fence. <laughs> hey, man, how you doing? I'm doing fantastic. I'm doing fantastic. I uh, once we got connected on Clubhouse, and then I went out and followed you on all your socials and all that stuff, and went out and watched some shows. And um, I know someone from your show reached out and said, "Hey, you want to come on the show?" I said, "Absolutely, freaking lootly. Let's do it." Let's do it, man. Well, I'm glad you're here. And you have a unique position because you have helped uh, many, many businesses understand how to profit. Now, is that the same thing in life when we talk about people? Because you look at people across this country, especially over this last year, and they're looking at, well, I'm a person. I may not have a business or I even might have a business idea, but how do I profit as a person? Because I'm pretty sure some of your techniques you use in personal everyday life, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's 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 a thing. It's so applicable, Finch, across whether it's business, it's personal, doesn't matter. I mean, a lot of these these things we use, strategies, techniques, et cetera, it's it's everywhere, right? It's in your personal life, it's in your family life, it's everywhere. Yeah. Now I read somewhere that you ascended to the top uh top three percent of a Fortune 15 uh company. And what would you say contributed to you being able to do that? Oh man. Well, the, the cliched answer is, is hard work, right? Uh, and there was plenty of that. I worked my butt off for sure. But I'll tell you, honestly, one of the things that really helped me in my career, especially early on in my career, Ascend, was I got some really, really good advice when I was interning, when I was in college. And I was interning and I asked uh, the guy I was interning with, I said, you know, give me some advice here. What should I be doing? So he gave me uh, several different things. But one of the things he told me that stuck with me is he said, take every communication class, every elective you take should be a communication class, whether it's written communication, you know, giving presentations, all that kind of stuff. He said, take those because when you get in your corporate career, there are going to be a lot of other people that are smart. There are going to be a lot of other people that work hard. How do you set yourself apart? And if you cannot, if you're the smartest person ever, but you can't communicate at all, you're never going to go anywhere. Mm -hmm. And it was, so it was funny, Finch, while I was in college. Oh man, you got stuck right in the middle o'clock in the morning finishing a presentation I'm giving, right? I'm, I'm not happy about it at the time, but it helped me. You know, when I was 25, I'd gotten to a point, you know, in the corporate world that I never even expected to get to, you know, 10 years down the road. And a lot of it I attribute to, to having those communication skills, I think were very important. So that was one thing for sure. But, you know, the hard work and, um, you know, just, just keeping your nose to the grindstone um, and figuring out what you can do to be the most valuable person for your company you're working for in your business for your employees your family etc so i think that's the, the the most important thing i learned and i think helped me ascend and get to that you know level at, at uh at jp morgan okay now now you you mentioned hard work and we're, we always hear the way you make it in this life is hard work but most times people don't tell us what does hard work actually entail like what are some of the the ingredients to Hard work. Is it waking up at a certain time every morning? Is it doing A, B, or C? What exactly is hard work, in your opinion, to help one move or progress in life, whether it be in business or personally? Man, I think it's real for me, and I it's funny you say that. And you know, you're right. We always talk about hard work. I always talk also about work smart, not hard. I don't mean not to work hard, but I just mean a lot of times we get bogged down on a lot of details and minutia. And we miss a lot of the big picture, right? We get stuck in the weeds on things. And so I think that's a really important thing that helps you work harder mm -hmm. is to not let a lot of the ancillary things bother you, right? Stay focused, 
know what you're doing. I, I preach this to business owners all the time. I call them RPAs, okay. revenue producing activities. And what happens so often, especially as a business owner, but we, this happens in your personal life as well, is you get bogged down in all the minutiae and the details. You take a step back and you go, what, what, you know, I was really busy. Mm -hmm. What did I actually accomplish? What did I get done? And so I think, especially for business owners, you know, making sure that you're dedicating the amount of proper amount of time to RPAs, then all of a sudden you might be working the same amount of time, but it's actually smarter work. So you're getting a lot more done. You're accomplishing a lot more and not just being busy. There's a big difference. And you know that Finch, right? Mm -hmm. There's a big difference between being busy and working your butt off being busy and working your butt off and being productive. The differences between those two, whether it be a business owner, personal life, are absolutely astronomical. Now, I call that having a lot of activity, but no productivity. That's exactly what that equates to, because people always say, you know, I'm busy doing this. I'm busy doing that. But when you really look up, they're not really doing anything. They got a lot of activities going on. They're involved in a lot of things. But there's no productivity coming out of the activity. And I think that's counterproductive in your life when you're looking at being successful. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll tell you, I fell victim to it myself in 2019. Mm. So I got down at the end of the year and I had been working my face off, like putting in tons of hours and staying up late and all this other stuff. And I got really frustrated because I was doing a little bit of like a postmortem look back in December of 19 at the year. And I'm looking at it and I'm like, man, I didn't get enough stuff done. Mm. And why didn't I? And here's what I found when I did some, some self-reflection. I was literally Finch working on 13 different projects at the same time. Now, I got work done on all 13, but I didn't get any one of them actually completed. Wow. And so I felt I fell victim to it, too. And I was being productive, but I wasn't focused enough. And so I, that's a lesson for me. And having an entrepreneur mind and always like all off everywhere. Right. I'm always, oh, I got this new idea. I got this. I'm chasing these shiny objects. I have to really stay focused myself because. Mm. Otherwise, I get running off and I'm, I'm doing 13 projects and, you know, making progress on each of them, but not completing any of them. So, you know, like I said, I, I learned it the hard way myself as an entrepreneur. <laughs> mm. now, now, I read also that you hold six world records. I would love to know what those world records are in and how did you accomplish that? Uh, they are in the uh, drug free powerlifting world, specifically uh, in the bench press. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I know. Look at me. Right. Uh, <laughs> okay. Wow. Now, now, were you a Olympic athlete of some sort or? So uh, powerlifting is an is not an Olympic sport. OK. However, they have they have national championships. They have world championships. So I won. Uh, I, honestly, I don't even remember how many world championships uh, that I, I won. When I got to a certain point and that was the next evolution in my competitive career, it was. Once I won nationals, that helped, that gets you qualified for the world championships. And then once I was able to win some of those, I started setting my sights higher. What what's next? And so that's when I really set my sights on. I got I need to break a world record. And then you break one, and so now you got to need to break another one. And so and then I also switched weight weight classes. Uh, which I wanted to throw another element into it. So I I wanted to have uh, world records in four different weight classes. Um, so that took a whole nother set of discipline, right? You know, I got to. I got to eat like crazy to gain weight to get to the next weight class or I'm cutting weight to, to get down a, a weight class. So, uh, but yeah, that's, that's, and boy, I'll tell you, I, the first time I bench pressed 275 pounds, I told the guys I was training with, and I was training with some pretty high level folks. I said, I want to bench press 500 pounds. And even those guys who were, you know, very accomplished and ambitious people, they all said, uh, yeah, man, you, you need to take a step back. Like, that's that's crazy talk. Like, what, what are you talking about? Um, and it took it took me seven years to get mm. from 75 to the first time I bench pressed uh, 500. So uh, but I got there and it was a bumpy road and a lot of different things and injuries and all that kind of stuff. But, um, yeah, it's I'm, I'm actually very proud of it and I'm very happy. And a lot of the things, just like you said at the outside of the show, a lot of the things that I learned from that experience and accomplishing some of those things, I apply to business mm. because again, just like we were talking about earlier, it, it all cross pollinates, right? It all works together. And a lot of the same techniques and, and, and theories that go behind being successful in athletics. Uh, all right. He, his uh, internet connection is going out. Um, he might need a Wi-Fi reboot. Uh, that gives us a great time right in the middle of the conversation. I, I hate that he he popped out, but we'll we'll get him back in here. 
Yeah, he's right back here. All right. Yeah, sorry about that. I'm hardwired in. I'm not sure what the heck happened there. Somebody didn't want you to say what you had to say. Yeah, no kidding. I don't know. It must be the man trying to keep me down. <laughs> he got his foot on your neck. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so yeah. So, look, looking at the hard work and, well, not just the hard work, just the work you put into it. How do you think a, a person, an everyday Joe, who who's not a part of a Fortune 500 or 100 or 15, you know, how do they apply? Because I think I think oftentimes we look at success in one realm, but success could be just for me setting a goal and accomplishing that goal. Just that goal, no matter what it is. It could be learning how to tie your shoe. I had a I had a goal to learn how to tie a tie like the one you got on. And you know what I did? I set that goal and I, I searched and searched and searched. I couldn't learn how to tie one for the life of me. And one day I found a YouTube video that showed me exactly what to do. I watched the video a couple of times and I followed what the video said. And to me, that was me having a success in an area. I think as a whole, we've often been programmed to believe success is only when you have a, a certain amount of money, when you've accumulated a certain amount of material things. But you hold six world records, and that is a success in itself. Nobody else may ever recognize that about your life, but that's something you can say you've done and, and you did it through a process. And you said it took several years. It took in, working through injuries. That's a whole nother mindset you got to have. When you're looking at right now in this world, we're com- we're, most people believe we're out of the pandemic, but I think it's the, the next phase of it is really just starting. But for those who are looking to get back into the workforce or a new workforce or reopening up America and the world as a whole, what advice would you give them in how to profit? Now, that profit could be, again, money, but more so I look at what you've done personally with the royal records you hold. And that took a process. What are some of the things, what a recipe you would give somebody that's saying, "Okay, Mr. Biz. I know about your business acumen. I know about some of your successes in holding world records in in one realm, but I'm an everyday person and I don't know how to how to get back on my feet from this point so I can profit just enough to feed my family. What's something you would tell them, Mr. Biz? Man, Finch, I'm telling you, you must be reading my mind. So I literally (laughs) uh, and I'll I'll, I'll give you the short version of this. I have a, a keynote that I give that is, I, and I didn't even realize I had this. And I I was looking back at, I was talking with someone who I mentor and I was walking him through this, almost the exact same question that you asked Finch. And it made me realize that I had a process that I went through to accomplish a lot of these things in my life. And it was something that I didn't realize I had it. Right. But the, um, it's called, I call it the SMAC. Uh, it's S M A C, right. You got to have an acronym, right. So people can remember it, but and, and the, what it stands for. So the S is start with yes. That's the first thing. And this is a way for people to reach their full potential. And I tell people this all the time is I'm a regular guy and I've been fortunate enough to be able to accomplish some, some you know, kind of cool things, I think. And so very interesting um, way to look at it. So, but the first thing you got to do is you got to start with yes. You got to have that right mindset that you're going to make this happen. You've got to start with yes. I'm going to do this. It's the, the, and I'm not even a big Star Wars guy, but one of my favorite quotes is the Yoda quote. Do or do not, there is no try. Mm. You have to commit that you're going to do it. So starting with yes, that's the S. The M is, look, you don't have to recreate the wheel here. Model expert behavior. Find Mm. someone who has already accomplished some of the things that you want to do and model their behavior. I'm not saying to copy them, but model their behavior. Real quick example, when I set out to set world records and uh, uh, become uh, successful in the powerlifting world, I found a guy who was based in Iowa. I'm in Ohio. Okay. And he was a world record holder. And I found this guy. And this was this was a long time ago. So this was like, you know, there was the internet and all that stuff, of course, but you know, it wasn't as easy. People weren't as easily as accessible. I reached out to this guy, didn't know him, reached out to him and said, Hey, I live in Ohio. I, I want to know if I fly out to Iowa, can I stay? I'll stay in a hotel. Can I train with you for a week? Hmm. That's all I want to do, because I want to learn from you. There, he was someone who had already been to the promised land that I was trying to get to. Let me go learn from this guy. And he thought I was nuts. I showed up in Iowa, stayed in a little crappy motel and trained with him and followed him around like a puppy dog for a week and learned everything I possibly could from him. 
So that's the M, model expert behavior. Someone's already probably done some of the things that you want to accomplish. Find someone who's done it and model their behavior. The A is accountability. You got to have accountability. And when I give the keynote, one of the things I do, it's always pretty funny, is I'll say, okay, everyone out there that likes to disappoint people, raise your hand. (laughs) Right? No one likes to disappoint people, right? <laughs> so, so you have to create a sphere of accountability around you. And I did that in a lot of different ways in my lifting career. And that's not just saying, hey, telling your buddies, hey, make sure you hold me accountable, right? Because especially what you, what you don't want and what can fall short on that, Finch, is that if I tell you that, let's say, Finch, I, I've got a goal and I tell you my goal and you and I are talking regularly, you mm-hmm. know that I'm falling short on my goal. Right. You're my friend. You don't want to ask me about it because you don't want to make it awkward, which actually is what I need is you to ask me. Right. But sometimes that makes it awkward for people. So I would do it in a lot of different ways. Um, One of the things, uh, absolutely silly thing, but I used to get these uh, like little index cards. Mm -hmm. Right. And so the weight that I wanted to lift, I would I would put the I would print out like five of them and I would put them on my monitor. So I would see it all the time. I was remembering for myself. I would put it in my office and when in the corporate world. I would put it on the dashboard of my truck. I put them all over the place. And what happens is people see it and they go, what the hell do you have a note card <laughs> with a number on it? Right. They ask the question. And so now I tell them that's my goal, at my next competition. The next time I see them, they go, hey, how's it going? Right. So I'm creating that sphere of accountability. Um, and, and a lot of these people are coworkers. You know, they're cheering, cheering me on. They don't know how my training is going. So they're going to ask me about it. So I create that sphere of accountability. Super, super important. And then the last one, the C and SMAC is what I call consistent perseverance. Mm. You, you, you absolutely will get knocked down. Like, I don't care how smart you are, how strong you are, you know, all that stuff. Life is going to knock you down. I mean, all these people that we look at and we, you know, we consider successful, the Oprah Winsby's of the world, the Bill mm. Gates, the, the Warren Buffett's, the, the Denzel, Denzel Washington, like all of these people that we consider successful. When you hear their stories, you see all the times they got knocked down. You know, Oprah was told that she she never would have a career in TV. Right. Right. And she said, bump that. I'm going to be successful. Right. And mm-hmm. she figured out what, you know, how, how to make it happen. Uh, the gosh, I just escaped my name. Uh, his name is escaping me. The guy who started Starbucks, he was turned down, I think, 108 times when he was trying to get funding to start Starbucks. He didn't stop at 50. He didn't stop at 60. I mean, imagine the perseverance, the consistent perseverance it takes. So that those three things or those four things. Starting with yes, get your mindset right, modeling expert behavior, find someone who, whatever it is you're trying to accomplish, like you mentioned, Finch, it doesn't have to be a business thing. It could be learn how to tie a tie. You did that, Finch, right? You yep. found an expert who on a YouTube video and you you modeled their behavior, right? That's how you accomplish that. You create that accountability. So you 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 don't want to let people down. You want to have your, your sphere of accountability and then consistent perseverance. And if you do those four things and you apply that, the things you can accomplish are crazy, absolutely insane. I, a, a, a quick example of that. When I was lifting, I figured out there are weight classes and you weigh in 24 hours ahead of time before you compete. So I found that, man, if I could drop weight, like, a, like you hear wrestlers do, right? If I could right. drop weight, make weight, and then can I regain that weight? Can I keep my strength? What did I do? I found someone who was a master at body weight manipulation. I read five books about it, and I, the guy that I like the most, I same thing. I reached out to him. I'm still friends with the guy to this day. Mm. And so, here's the other thing: I will usually ask people to give them an example. So they go, "Oh, you cut weight. You know, how much weight did you cut?" So, and I usually ask the question in the keynote of, you know, how much weight could you lose in a week? How much weight could you lose in a day? So, in a 24 hour period, I lost 17 pounds of body weight in 24 hours. And then when I, the next day when I competed, I had gained back 18 pounds. Um, and so that's an example. And I don't say that to brag. I say that to say I'm a regular person, but I applied that smack methodology. And that's the, that's the kind of thing that I was able to accomplish. And even now I look back and say, how in the heck did I ever do that? Right. I mean, it's crazy, but we so often don't reach our full potential because we don't we don't allow ourselves to think of what is possible, right? We, we limit ourselves. We put a ceiling on some of the things that we're able to accomplish. And I think that's the biggest thing that holds people back. So I think you got to really work through those four things. And man, I'll tell you, it's, it's super powerful. Well, two things here. I'm the friend 
that won't bite his tongue and making sure that you ain't if you're not doing what you you said you want to do i'm gonna be on you and i don't care how awkward it gets that's number one number two for for people out here i'm people how did you lose 17 pounds in a night i need to lose 17 tonight <laughs> well keep in mind and i get that all the time people you know a lot of times men and women right after i give the keto they'll be like okay i'd love to lose some weight if you could do that in one day you know you got to tell me your trick you got to keep in mind, the whole goal of it was for it to be short term. So it was all water weight. It was all water weight. I wasn't losing 17 pounds of fat in a day or anything like that. It's all water weight. It's dropping your water weight down so you can regain it very quickly to get back. And I'll tell you, it, the whole process is absolutely amazing um, to be able to do, uh, to see the, the, the changes that your body goes through during that time. And once I got my system down again, had to have a system for it. Um, once I got that down, I mean, I knew, and again, I'm a numbers nerd. I tell everybody all the time. So I, I, had a, I got a spreadsheet Finch that I could send you to blow your mind that I know I cut off food here and I know it's six hours where I should be and at 12 hours in where I should be and it's 16 hours. And so I know, and I monitor my body weight throughout that 24 hour period. So I know if I'm ahead or behind. Um, but yeah. It, and then once you, um, make weight and then how quickly your body recovers, you know, and you have to, you have to drink the right things and at the right time and all that stuff, or you don't get an upset stomach and all that stuff, but it's amazing. And, and the weird part about it is by the next day, when I'm competing 24 hours after making weight, I feel better than I have in like six months because I've hyper nutri put nutrients in my body. And so my body feels like fantastic the next day. So, um, but yeah, it's, it's just, it's water, it's body, water, Wait, body weight, water manipulation, basically, um, is, you know, part of the process leading up to it. And here's part, you know, again, these things aren't always easy, right? If it was easy, <laughs> right. everyone could do it, right? Mm -hmm. So one of the things I do is I start 12 weeks out and I drink what, uh, what water every day and a lot of water. And I get to the point where right before I cut off my water, I'm drinking three gallons of water a day to condition my body to get used to getting rid of water naturally right so that way when i cut off water my body still thinks i'm going to drink three gallons that day so my 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 body is still trying to get rid of three gallons of water and again i learned that because i modeled expert behavior i you know found someone who knew how to do that and told me oh man this is what you got to do um so just a, a, an example but yeah it's it, it's crazy I, the first time uh my wife went with me uh we started we were actually i i we, I think we were dating at the time. She went with me. My wife's a nurse and she went with me in a competition. I told her, I said, this is going to get a little crazy. I, mean, I got to cut a bunch of weight. And I, w I could not shed the last few pounds. And one of the last things I do is I take super hot salt water baths because uh -huh. the water, you'll sweat out wa you know, water in, in the water and the salt pulls some of the water through your pores. And it, I, my body was just holding on to it. And I couldn't just shed those last few pounds. And I knew I was not going to give up. And I literally came out. And I would go in for a half hour and I come out for a half hour. And I go in for a half hour. And I had taken, I don't know how many of these baths. Usually I take about three and I'm good. And I had taken probably six, I want to say. And I came out and I was so depleted. And I laid down on the bed. At, we were in Chicago. And she, my, my wife said, what, what can I do? How can I help you? And Finch, I'm not going to lie. You know what I told her? I said, put the pillow over my head and smother me because I, I would not be able to fight you off. And I know that I'm not going to stop until I make it. <laughs> put me on my misery right now. Take me out behind the woodshed. <laughs> so, so, so for those who just joined us, because they came in and you talking about losing 17 pounds in 24 hours. Somebody wants to know they need the whole plan, they say. <laughs> It's men and women across the country, like 17 pounds in 24 hours. I don't care how temporary it is. I need to fit into this dress. I need to fit into this suit. Uh, I need to fit into this T-shirt. <laughs> you know, so they want the whole plan. Now, you said something interesting. You said you take hot salt water baths. How yeah. long are you in the water? So, yeah, again, it's all system. So I, I'm in there. So I get I go whenever I get to the town where I'm competing. I go out and I'm sure when I go to the grocery store, the person checking me out is like, what is this dude doing? Because I'm buying a bunch of Epsom salt, like a bunch of it, right? They think you're cooking cocaine. Yeah, probably, <laughs> right? Probably. 
but yeah, so I go in and I, I monitor the temperature too. So it has to be really hot, which is a good thing about usually, you know, in that situation, I'm in a, in a uh, hotel. So the hotel has the hot water gets super hot. Right. Uh -huh. But I, and then I submerge my body and really key is your, your face is your head's got to be under cause you lose heat through your head and you want to keep that heat in when you're trying to elevate your body temperature, your heat and your feet are super important. Mm -hmm. So that's super hot, a lot of salt. And I go in for uh, 30 minutes and then it takes me about 10 minutes to ease my way out. Uh, cause you get out too fast, you'll pass out. For PSA, right? <laughs> Public <laughs> service announcement there. Um, and then I go and I, I lay down on the bed for the other 20 minutes until I get to the top of the hour. And then I, I reheat the water and do it again. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's intense, but uh, it's, I mean, accomplishing that goal in and of itself is crazy, right? I, I regularly, so 17 was the most I did in 24 hours, but I would regularly, I mean, 12 to 15 was the norm. And it was a huge advantage for me because, so let's say, for example, uh, when I cut 17 pounds, I went from 215 pounds down to 198. And then the next day, like I said, I weighed 216. So I'm competing in a 190. And this is all legal. It's all, you know, people can do it, but no one does it because it's so freaking hard to do. Right. But so the next day I weigh two, I weigh 216 and I'm competing. Again. Some guys might be light in the class. They might be 190 pounds and I weigh 218. Think of the advantage that is. Like they have weight class for a reason. The heavier you are, right, the, the, the more you can lift, presumably. So, And they're um, not checking your weight the day of, right? No. The only time that comes into play is if there's a tie. Uh, if you tie somebody, they will re-weigh you then. It's never happened to me. Um, I would I would, be, I'd lose every time. I mean, <laughs> for sure. Here's a question. You said it made – somebody said you said it made you feel better. Does it reset your metabolism? No, I mean, because it's only one day and, and it's just water weight, it doesn't. Because here's the thing, I had a very detailed plan of what I had to eat and at what intervals after I weighed in, because I had to eat food that was familiar to me, because you can't just go crazy. Like, oh, I'm going to eat all this crazy stuff because I haven't eaten in 24 hours, which is what you want to do. Mm -hmm. But I had very regimented how much, um, how much water and liquid I had to bring back into my body, what specific liquids I had to bring back into my body at what times. So I knew I had to get in three gallons of fluid in my body before I went to bed that night. And so I had to get them in at a certain time because I didn't want to be up all night peeing, right? and not to be gross. But, you know, so and if, you, if you drink it too fast, it won't stick. And so there's all the whole method to it. But and eating things at a certain time, but it's because it's only 24 hours, it doesn't doesn't really have any impact on your metabolism. I guess it would, you know, temp very, very temporarily, but it wouldn't reset it for, uh, you know, longer term. All right. So so when we're looking at methods and how we profit in life, uh, whether it be personally or in business, and we, we, we hear you talking about shedding weight. Now, again, people, if you guys are listening, you might you're hearing him talk about body weight. And that may be what he was using in the context of the story he was telling. But when I hear that, I'm thinking about weight, period, you know, like. So many of us are burdened with with things that we've been carrying, just like our weight. You know, some of us are, some of us have uh, <laughs> have uh, what's the word I want to use? We have enlisted some COVID weight that we did not have previously, <laughs> and so we want to shed those things physically. But we've also brought in some things mentally that we we need to shed. And you travel all across the country. Now, somebody mentioned earlier about uh, burn the ships, tell your burn the ship story. Uh, I would love to hear that story because that sounds like where we want to be right now as we are venturing out and we are reclaiming our lives or re uh, positioning ourselves in society. What's the burn the ship story? Because I'm feeling like we have to burn some things as we come out of COVID and out of the things that COVID may have caused. Some of us have lost family members, friends, co-workers. And life is not the same. It's never going to be the same again. So let's talk about the burn the ships method that you use often. And uh, mm -hmm. let's see what the, let's see what that story is. Yeah. And it's it's not my story. It's a, it's uh there was a, um, uh, a, a traveler way back when uh, named Cortez. This was back, I think, the 16th century. And as the story goes, he was brought to he, he said, I'm going to sail from uh, Cuba to Mexico. And he said, I'm going to conquer the land for us. 
So he gets there and I'm telling the short version of the story, but mm-hmm. he gets to land and he, he they're outnumbered 500 to one. They, they get the ships there. They get up over the horizon. They look out and they're like, holy crap, we had no idea there were this many people. And again, I, the, the numbers probably embellished over time. I have no idea. Right. I wasn't around. <laughs> uh, I got a lot of gray hair, but I wasn't around back then, Finch. Um, but he so his guys look at him and say, what, what the heck are we going to do? And he said, burn the ships. And they said, wait a minute, wh- why, why would we burn the ships? How, how are we going to retreat? If we start getting our butts kicked, we have no way of getting off this thing. Like we're, we're done. We're doomed. And he said, that's right. Burn the ships. Because now there will be no option. Victory or death. That's the only two choices you're going to have. So you're going to fight really, really hard. If you know that if things start getting tough, you can just tuck tail and run back to the ship and sail away. How hard are you going to fight? Wow. If the ship burn, you are going to fight because you know your butt's on the line and you're not going to make it out otherwise. Um, and so that, that you know, I, I use that hashtag all the time, burn the ships, because I think a lot of times you, you have to have that mentality. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm a, I like to manage risk and have a plan B, but I also think that sometimes having a plan B is bad for us mm. because again, in that example, if I know, Hey, I'm going to go out here and I'm going to try pretty hard, but man, if I start getting my butt kicked, I just, I can just run back to the ship and take off. Well, knowing that doesn't make you fight as hard, right? Because you know, you have a fallback. And so I think sometimes and you hear all these stories and you, uh, there's a gazillion amount out there that people have had where they didn't have a choice, mm-hmm. right? You, you, you uh, uh, the rock, Dwayne Wa- Johnson talks about, he was down to his last $7. He, he, he didn't have, he, his ship was burned. He only had seven bucks, you know? And so, uh, you know, I think a lot of times we need to get our, our, get our, get our backs really against the wall to that level to really accomplish and really realize the full potential. Because if you think about times in your life where you've been faced with something, not death, hopefully, but where you really had the odds stacked against you and you just said, hey, you know what? The heck with this. I'm going to fight my butt off and I'm going to do it. And you did it. Think of how you can lean back on that experience now into new things that you want to try to accomplish. Because if you've done it once, you can tap into that again. Absolutely. I, Mr. Biz, I, I, for a long time, have never believed in having a plan B. And I'm going to tell you why. Will Smith taught me this years ago. He said, having a plan B distracts from plan A. You got to work plan A until it works for you. And if you got to modify it, it's okay. But having a plan B, I think somebody said this here, you expect plan A to fail. I don't expect my plan A to fail, so I never have a plan B. I've never had a plan B. Plan A must work. Is he frozen again? <laughs> He's frozen again. <laughs> plan B is plan A. Yes. <laughs> no. Plan B is plan A. Yes, that's right. I don't believe in plan Bs. I, I think I think when you have a plan B, you subconsciously believe that your plan A may not work at all. And uh, you it's almost like the ships, man. It's like, hey, if this don't work out, I'm going to give it a little bit of what I got, but if it don't work out, I always got this to fall back on. And that I think that's part of the system of why so many people across the country are stuck even right now is because we've been systematically programmed to believe a fallback plan works. I think if you plan properly with plan A, plan A works the way you anticipate it working. And again, if it's not working the way you anticipate it, you make modifications to it. That's why architect designs in pencil. So they can make modifications. <laughs> right. Absolutely. And here's the thing, just like I was mentioning earlier, it's probably not going to work out the way you think. And that's OK. I mean, there's going to be bumps in the road. There are going to be curveballs thrown at you. But the person who is successful is the person who keeps getting up. They mm-hmm. keep exhibiting consistent perseverance. Because, again, as I mentioned earlier, we're all I mean, again, that doesn't matter how smart you are, strong, successful, beautiful, handsome, whatever. Your life is going to knock you down, man. It just it's just inevitable. So are you going to get up or are you going to be in a fetal position? Because the people in the fetal position, they're not successful. Mm-hmm. And, and by the way, you know, 
we all have these people in our lives, man. I, I, I know I got them in my, uh, you know, some people that I know pretty well that um, I just saw a, a, a meme the other day on social media. It said, stay away from still people, still broke, still complaining, <laughs> still blaming other people. Right. And we all have still people in our lives. And you got to limit your time around them. At least I do, because I, you know, I recognize that, man. I, I just can't. And, and I, I want to clarify about plan B. I agree with you a thousand percent, Finch. The only plan B I'm talking about is a little bit different. And that's like uh, for a business owner, when you have a supplier who supplies 90 percent of the raw material you use, you need to have a second supplier in case something happens to the first one. Right. You got a plan B for that, because, uh, you know, if your suppliers in in Florida and Florida gets hit with a hurricane and their their warehouse gets wiped out, and you don't have a plan B, you're stuck. right? Right. So the plan B is more for your external risks, not for you. Because I, I agree with you. I agree there with you. you. And that example, you know, when I was cutting that weight, when I <laughs> told my wife to put the pillow over my head, I knew I wasn't going to stop because not making weight was not, that's not, that plan is not even in the realm. Mm-hmm. That is not going to happen. I am going to make weight. And I, I know I'll keep going until I do. And I did, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Hey, listen, there's some men out there that just heard what I said. They were telling, they telling a side girl, hey, listen. <laughs> Don't you listen to him. You keep that plan B pill. <laughs> no, that's not what I'm talking about. That's right. That's a, well, that's a whole other conversation. A whole other conversation. <laughs> <laughs> All, right. All right, man. So um, uh, right, real quick before we get out of here, um, if what would be your final words to people who are looking to profit at this stage in their life? And again, guys, it doesn't matter if you're how young you are or how old you are. Cause you know, a lot of times, especially now we're figuring, Hey, it's too late for me to start this. It's too late for me to do that. Um, what would you say to someone who may have that mentality right now as they are re- trying to reposition themselves, start something new, uh, get something that they've been doing that they feel like hasn't been working for them. What would you say to them to profit right now? That's tangible and something that they can do tomorrow. So two things I'll mention. Number one, for anyone out there who's thinking it's too late, I can't do this. I'm too old now, whatever. Everyone's heard of KFC, right? Kentucky Fried Chicken. Everyone's heard of Colonel Sanders. Do you know that Colonel Sanders started KFC when he was 62 years old? Wow. 62. So if he can make KFC at 62, you can do whatever the heck you want. So don't even get that the heck out of your mind. And there's a whole bunch of examples of that, of people of super success. Uh, uh, the guy, um, what was his name? John, not John Walton. The guy who started Walmart. He started Walmart. I think he was he was mid 40s, 44, 46, something like that. I mean, think about that. It's crazy, right? Wow. So that's the first thing. Drop the, the noise about age, man. If you If you got it in here, you can make it happen. Doesn't matter how old you are. And the other thing, as far as what you can do now that's tangible, I would be willing to bet that people that are listening now and are going to watch this in the future, there is something in you that you got way back here in the back of your head that you've always wanted to do. And you you have not done it for whatever reason, right? You've always made some, some excuse in your head. I can't do it because of this. Once I get through this, I'll do it. And you never get through that. You always have that. Do it. Do it. Take action. Here's the thing. And this is, you know, people, I've heard people say this all the time. When you get to your deathbed, what are you going to regret more? Mm. Risk that you took that maybe didn't work out? Or are you going to look back and go, man, I wish I would have done that. I wish I would have tried. I wish I would have given that a shot. I probably should have done that. Think back on your life now. You know, Mm. no matter how old you are, there are probably things that you've already gone by that you didn't do. And you're like, gosh, dang it. I wish I would have done that. Don't worry about it. You know, they talk about the, the definition of an entrepreneur, someone who jumps off a cliff and figures out how to make a plane on the way down. Right. You just do it. You know, <laughs> do it. and again, it's not going to probably turn out the way you think. And you're just going to take you might have a plan for 90 days and it takes you nine months. That's OK. Mm-hmm. Consistent perseverance. Keep at it. But take the risk. I, I share uh, on social media every week. I have a Mr. Biz tip of the week. And one I've had ever since I started doing this and I will keep it because I love it is to, to take the risk. Business and life is like the UFC. It's like MMA. No mm-hmm. one goes undefeated. No one goes undefeated, right? Mm-hmm. And, and the other part that I added to make it sort of funny is that the road is full of flat squirrels who couldn't make a decision. <laughs> <laughs> 
make a decision. I'm going to get to the other side of the freaking road. I'm not going to get in the middle and go, oh, crap, and turn around, right? Go. Just go and, and figure it out along the way, man. If, you, if you've got some passion about something, you will figure it out because you won't quit. You won't have a plan B. You're going to say, I will do it, man. Make that commitment. You know, start with yes. Model an expert. Create the accountability and then consistent perseverance. You follow that pattern, man. You will, you will kick butt and accomplish. First of all, you get your ass off the fence, right? <laughs> and right. then you accomplish some crazy stuff. Oh, man, that's good, man. Don't be like the flat squirrel in the road, ladies and gentlemen. Make a decision. That, that's the whole thing. I hear, Mr. Biz, people say all the time, oh, that's hard. Well, it's hard to do this. It's hard to do that. You know what the hard thing is? Making a decision. Yep. When you when you eliminate the fact that it's not the the thing that you're talking about is not hard. It's you making a decision whether to do it or not to do it. You know, the old saying to be or not to be. You got to decide whether or not you want to stay on the fence or you want to get your ass off of it. That's the only hard thing that I see in life, no matter what it is. Nothing you're going to do in life is going to be hard for you to do. What's going to be hard is you just deciding to do it and then sticking to it. You just got to make a decision. Life is not hard, ladies and gentlemen. Making the decision. I, I have had to teach myself this forever, especially here in the last couple of years. When life hits you with a curveball or a, a, a 97 mile per hour fastball, <laughs> either way it goes, doesn't matter what the pitch is, you got to make a decision. Are you going to swing? Or are you going to stand in the batter's box and look at life past you back? It goes back to the Yoda quote, do or do not. There is no try. When mm. someone tells me, you know, when I, I mentor folks and they go, well, yeah, I'm going to try to do that. I go, oh, hold on. Tell me right now. Are you going to do it or are you not going to do it? There's no, don't try to do anything. You try don't do take it. any effort. Try is a plan B. <laughs> try is, like you said earlier, Finch. Hey, I'll give it. I'll, I'll give it my best shot here. I'll give it a pretty good shot. But I, if I'm not, I tried. I no, tried. Forget the trying, man. Commit to doing it. Commit to doing it. Do it. Do it. Do it. Do it or don't. That's why I've told my kids this for years. If you're going to commit to something, you got to you got to mm -hmm. say I'm going to do it. Or if you're not willing to make that commitment, do something else. Find exactly. something else. You know, because that's that's what it takes. I think we live in a world, Mister B, is where. It's acceptable to people to say, at least I tried. That's acceptable. That's like a huge accomplishment to people. At least I tried. What? I don't want to just try to do something. I'm either going to kill it or I'm going to flunk and fall and fail at it. But I don't want to be patted on the back for just attempting to do something but never really accomplish it. I, I think you should go after what you want or you're going to have to continuously settle for what you can get. That's my thoughts. I love it. Yeah, I, I agree with you 100 percent. All right, man. So before we get out of here, if people want to connect with you online. How can they do so? Man, I'm on uh, pretty much all the socials uh, and I'm Mr. Biz on all of them. Yo, 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 yo. You're in the mix. The world's finest, man. DJ. Like I have the radio on the telly. <laughs>